My name is Bill Fitzgerald. I'm the senior uh, privacy officer at Learn Platform, um, and I will be moderating. So, uh, actually, quickly starting with Andrew, uh, let's do uh, intros. Great. Uh, my name is Andrew Wallace. I'm the technology director for South Portland Schools in the state of Maine, and I've been involved with the Student Data Privacy um, Consortium for a number of years. After Steve Smith was a, he won't take credit for anything dumb I say, but was a mentor of mine uh, when I was much much younger. And I also lead the State Technology Directors <laughs> Association, who oversees the consortium in the state of Maine. Hi, I'm Jenna Draper. I'm the founder and general manager of Catch On. And uh, Steve Smith, CIO in Cambridge Public Schools, Cambridge Mass, and founder of the consortium. I'm uh, Jim Siegel. I'm the technology architect for Fairfax County Public Schools. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to jump right in, and um, for the first question, and we'll maybe actually do reverse order from when we, uh, from how we just started. Um, if we could, if you could, if every panelist could define how, uh, how you see the scope of the issue. Um, basically what, when we talk about vetting or managing apps, what exactly are we talking about? Um, and if anybody wants to touch on even what you mean by the word vetting, and uh, how we should define or not define what should be vetted. Uh, Jim, you want to start us off or we'll go straight down the road? Um, sure. Uh, so when I think of vetting, uh, so it comes from veterinarian, it's basically, is, is the horse fit to run the race? Um, so is the, and it's, it's where it comes from. Um, so is, is the application fit to use in your district? And the most important thing um, from where I sit um, is introducing into the conversation the very distinct difference between vetting an application's privacy policy and, and vetting a technology. Um, they're very, very different things. Um, how many people here have, have bought a house? Okay. When you bought your house, how much time did you spend reading the sales contract versus hiring a home inspector to go and look at the house? And that's really the distinction between what we're talking about when we're talking about like looking at the, the terms of service or the privacy policy give you one view of how an application works. Actually inspecting and looking at the application and how it's collecting data and how it works is, is, is a very different and often those two things aren't connected and in some cases they contradict each other. Yeah, um, so I can't can't argue Jim's point, um, but if I was to buy a house today, what I'd love to do is like write my own contract <laughs> and have everyone agree to it. So that's kind of the approach I've taken with, uh, with apps and, and really through the consortium, really trying to make the process of onboarding apps as, as easy as possible. And I think if someday we can get to the point where we could in depth, um, you know, do that type of a vetting process for all apps, I think we want to get there. And I think it's great that you can do it in your district. But um, for me personally and through the consortium, the level of vetting that we're kind of talking about is, is assuring that at least contractually uh, through agreements that vendors are agreeing to certain uh, protections of student data, they meet the requirements uh, that are put upon schools through FERPA. I also cannot argue with either of those two gentlemen, but I'll take it a step back even further. I think it starts at a district understanding their own ecosystem. So what apps are being used? However you capture that data, I'm sure we will touch on this later, um, whether that's a digital inventory, whether that's a survey, but somehow understanding what your direct um, ecosystem looks like because we can't manage what we don't know. And so once you have um, visibility into what is being used, then you can start identifying what data is going out. And you can start asking more informed questions, having vendors sign various uh, privacy policies, whether that's for your state or SDPCs, so that's wonderful. Um, but, but you really become the driver of that conversation. And the, uh, the downside of going last is you can say you agree with everything that everyone else just said. <laughs> um, and for me, it's really about trying to identify all the people that are involved in the process and why do apps even come forward? Do we know what apps we have? Um, and, you know, have they gone through multiple layers of vetting beyond just the privacy? Are there educationally 
you know, efficacious? Are they worth the effort to even, you know, get people to arrive at a privacy standpoint that we can agree upon? So I like to see it as a holistic, you know, multi-part um, process where curriculum's involved, I'm involved, and also that we at least acknowledge that teachers are constantly um, not vetting or vetting and bringing things into our ecosystem that we don't even know about yet. Okay. Um, for future questions, I would like it if the panelists would disagree a little bit more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Um, second question, and for this one, actually, Jenna, we'll start with you. We'll go Jenna, Andrew, and then uh, Steve and Jim, just to mix things up. Um, but uh, so, second question, you know, a lot of, I mean, people are already doing this. So, when we think of organizations that are doing this, what are the building blocks for their success, and what are people currently doing that works? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, people are vetting applications uh -huh. and uh, bringing services into their schools. Mm -hmm. what are, uh, what's the foundation for doing this well? And what are some of the things that, pe that people are doing when they're doing it well that we can sure. hold up as okay. best practice or things to replicate? Okay, sure. So I, I don't, obviously don't sit in a district seat, so I won't claim to know this, but I do have some good anecdotes around um, things we've seen with our districts. Uh, we work with districts that are very small, 250 students. We work with some of the top 10 largest school districts. I've seen, I've seen the gamut on this, to be honest. Um, I think it depends on resources. So your smaller districts are, are obviously having more of a struggle. Um, because the resources are constrained. The larger districts are putting in much more sophisticated processes. Um, seen something really cool. There's a Colorado district that has developed their own vetting. And so what they do is they've created their own curriculum around how to vet apps. Uh, they have their own little online course that I believe is honestly a, a Google form, like a, a Google survey. And the teachers will take this and, and the staff will take this quiz. If they receive a certain score, what they will do is they will <coughs> enable them as their their certified app reviewers and so they're letting they're letting the staff have part of the responsibility in vetting these tools as well as kind of taking the responsibility off of the very resource constrained uh, CTOs who have a thousand other things to do um, I've seen very sophisticated programs I'm sure you know larger school districts um, what we've seen there are Sometimes there is a, a specific person who is designated, like there's a very large school district in Texas that there's a specific person who's designated to review privacy policies and constantly stay on top of what those policies change, actually reviewing the, the, um, the home inspection and going through those tools. Um, and some of the top districts in the country have their own security policies. Uh, where they're actually asking questions around who has access to those servers and what servers are you on and how do you date how do you handle data destruction so i think it just really goes to you know what is the size of the district and there's a variety of ways that they can do this but unfortunately it's it's kind of a, a mixed bag and it's it's really unfortunate because the districts are the ones that are suffering because of it yeah, I think you'll find success often when people clearly understand the rules of the game. And, you know, typically, even a curriculum director might not understand any of our FERPA or COPPA or HIPAA concerns when we are, not HIPAA, but related concerns when we're adopting software or programs. So really getting out ahead of it so that the tech department doesn't look like this um, person that just says no all the time and kills the initiatives all the time. Educating people about the requirements of the laws and that there are certain things that are deal breakers um, before people get too invested. In, and then you start setting up this you know, antithetical uh, relationship between the CTO and the people that wanna help kids learn as best they can. So by identifying somewhere clearly what the minimum rules are, I think you avoid a lot of those problems and it becomes a more collaborative uh, effort. So I was just trying to keep track of the order of bills. So. <laughs> I think this is good. <laughs> um, and one other note out of context, uh, for those soccer fans, the USA women won a few minutes ago. So my daughter was texting me and keeping me updated. Um, so uh, I guess I can't answer this question without talking about the consortium, obviously. And I think, um, you know, the foundation that the consortium has laid that other districts can build upon is is an example that we don't whatever we can share and not have to replicate in districts if they're 
are tools and resources that you can share about vetting apps and common data privacy agreements and practices. And that also leads to the power of the consortium in numbers. Um, you know, current, I'm gonna, right after this session, I'm gonna dive a little further into the Student Data Privacy Consortium, but in a, a great example is in California, how SETPA, the ISTE and COSIN chapter, has led the practice, and um, you know, they have a 1,000 school districts that are sharing <laughs> data privacy agreements and had a huge impact on the ed tech market in California, and that is expanding across the country. So um, getting together and solving the problems together, I think, is kind of that foundation um, that, that to build upon. Um, and then even taking that a step further, um, having even, even <coughs> with the consortium in place, there are uh, ways to share other services, the, the mechanics. There are, there are organizations popping up to help alliances manage data privacy agreements and legal services and combine those across districts. So again, it's, it's the power of sharing and not replicating the wheel in every district. We can learn from each other. I think some of the things that, that I've seen in, in my district and through the work that I do with COSIN in, uh, and the TLA program and looking at other districts, I see it starting with kind of getting your arms around what you have. Um, Janet talked about kind of getting an inventory of, of apps so you, you know what is where your data is, is uh, what applications are holding your data and where that data is going. Um, but also kind of inventorying what what the minimum requirements are. What are you on the hook for? And understanding what are the requirements in your, uh, in your state laws, in your board requirements, and what minimum requirements you have. Are there any bright red lines, whether it's you're not going to approve applications that have student data where there's no uh, SSL, or where they make the student work public, or that have targeted ads, kind of that. I think it's easy to kind of start with a small set of minimum don't go there requirements. Mm -hmm. And then you move on to um, the things that you deal with anything else, people, um, policies, process, um, and um, how those work to support the, the app vetting. Who, who owns this? What's the shared responsibility between vetting a, a, a tool for curriculum value versus is it technologically safe? And where does that go first? In my district, we've had the luxury of, of having a, a board regulation that says that everything first goes to curriculum for review and then it goes for a technical review. So being able to fall back on the when, why do we have to do this, being able to say that there's a board uh, supported regulation um, for, for that um, really helps. Um, and then working with, um, with the community, not just SDBC, but there's a lot of great work in, uh, in application vetting uh, through Common Sense Media, um, through their privacy initiative, um, where they uh, have a, uh, more than uh, several hundred districts um, working together as advisors and, and looking at applications. Um, and then also the uh, part of the, the COSIN uh, trusted learning environment supports the business processes around app vetting. Wouldn't it be better though to like have those bright red lines be on the privacy side and not have to go through the curriculum review? I actually, Do you know what I mean? So that I actually wanted to, because um, Andrew, you brought up uh, the idea of uh, red flags. Jim, you brought up bright red lines. Yeah. I would actually love to go just straight down the line and have everybody identify, let's keep it brief because we could go down a real rabbit hole here, but maybe one to two red flags or bright red lines that indicate, uh, in your opinion, a do not go. Yeah, I'd say um, an unclear or contradictory or clearly boilerplate um, agreement offered to us from a vendor that didn't seem to Something that looked like it came straight out of consumer world to me is like what would be my first stop or stop area for pause before I went to the next level. I've seen a couple of these recently. Um, a lot of people are focusing, especially in Colorado, on uh, data destruction policies. That's big emphasis uh, at a state, state level, as well as um, a lot of people are really, really focused on who creates the content. And um, I think Jim mentioned this earlier about, um, you know, if, if the content is created, uh, who, who owns that content and who gets access to it? Um, so 
in day-to-day -day practice, our bright red line is if we can't get a signed data privacy agreement. So <laughs> those, those negotiations come down to, um, you know, what is the particular items that they're pushing back on, whether it is the fact that they can't return the data or uh, a prohibition on advertising. So, so it could be a number of bright red lines, but it comes down to the signature on that data privacy agreement. Hey, Steve, what is an appropriate length of time for that negotiation to require? So that has changed over the years. I mean, it, it used to be, you know, anywhere from a month to a year. Mm -hmm. um, to now, it's probably a matter of weeks that we'll know one way or the other. Occasionally, one will drag on if it's a really, you know, large product that, uh, you know, takes a little more <laughs> negotiations. But at the most, a couple months. And we'll okay. know. I, I listed a couple of them before, but the thing that I want to interject in, in thinking about this is, you know, ultimately, um, you know, Steve's got, an, you know, the contract, the, the, the data sharing agreement that is the, the final piece. Um, so the question is, are there things as you're designing your app vetting workflow, um, do you handle it more like a, a triage process and there are a small number of, of checklists, no-goes, that you filter in at the beginning before you have something um, go through a curriculum review, and then ultimately there's they have to sign the, the data sharing agreement. I think I've seen lots of different success models with districts in terms of how they structure the flow. Do they do any kind of pre-filtering or, or, or how that works and where it fits in? I'm, I'm not a huge fan of putting the, the, the technology review um, cart before the horse um, because Otherwise, we review everything, um, and that becomes a real bottleneck. Um, the, the curriculum value has to be the driver. Um, but where you are there are there kind of a small number of of, uh, of, of uh, black ball checklists that you look at first uh, is useful. Can yeah. I add on one thing? Yeah. So back to what you were saying, Stephen, and what uh, Bill was asking you about timelines. I think what's really cool is that. You know, if you have that visibility and you know what's being used, what we've seen our districts do is they actually utilize that as leverage to control the conversation. And I shouldn't be saying this as a vendor, but I'm going to. That if you know what's being used, what they'll do is they'll go to those vendors and say, you've got 20% of our teachers using a free app. You want this app to be used? We want you to sign our policy, whether that's SDPCs or whatever that might be. It might be their, their district's DSA. Um, but now you're in the driver's seat because they want your teachers to still keep using that tool. And now you have that extra, that carrot and the stick. You were not CETA, you, you missed that, but we <laughs> talked a lot about carrot and stick. And uh, I think that that can really help you drive that conversation. Yeah. Andrew, you had a question earlier about uh, the um, not wanting to have the privacy piece, but have the security piece be, be the driver. Do you, would you like to yeah, I, I, I always worry about setting up antagonistic relationships, and I totally agree with you, Jim, on like, um, <laughs> that the, sometimes when we, it's like we sh something should be a non-starter, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that people should give up. They should do some outreach, like Jenna says, you know, we really want to use your, your tool, but I always worry, and even, you know, respected professionals will sometimes completely subvert systems and use tools, or they go through a big process of selecting the right tool and then we say no, and it's very difficult. And I worry sometimes that they just go deeper underground or tell kids to lie about their age. I can't, I'm blown away that professional <laughs> people do this, but it happens all the time. Even you know, district level administrators make really poor decisions like that. Yeah, question? There are multiple pieces to that question. I think kind of breaking it down into kind of three, three distinct sections, I mean, First is how, in vetting services and vetting applications, how, how should we resolve tensions or even call out tensions between curriculum staff and tech staff when deciding what apps to use? Along part of that, like how do we embed an awareness of, of the need for privacy and security within that decision-making process? And third part of that system, or, or that question is, when does uh, application vetting translate into governance and ongoing management? Is that an accurate summary? Pretty much. Okay. <laughs> so whoever would like to jump in on that first, have at it. 
uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer your question by not answering your question. <laughs> and, um, and, and, except for Steve. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think, to coin a phrase from our PTAC friends, oh, one is still here, sorry. Um, it depends, right? And every, every district is different. And I think um, it depends on the culture, it depends on the people in those positions, it depends on how those, those positions work together. And I think what you design as the right workflow is gonna be different for your district than my district. Um, and I really don't think one is any better than the other. It's what works for your district, I think, is my answer. So I would add, what we're, what we're talking about here is we're talking about risk management. I mean, it's not all that different than the process that your district would do when you approve a field trip. But the problem is there's a lot less friction because a lot of this stuff is free. It's very hard to arrange a field trip with, you know, without a, a little bit more level of process. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that any of our districts have a policy where it would be okay if the teacher just decided to bundle a bunch of kids into the back of their SUV and take them <laughs> off campus on a field trip. I think we all pretty much are on the same page on that one. So, you know, we're talking about, about risk management. So how do you define kind of that assembly line for um, streamlining this process? And, you know, our goal is to reduce risk. It's not to make teachers into FERPA lawyers. And when you, you know, when you look at kind of where the flags are, you have to pick your flags where it's not going to require somebody to have a law degree to be able to evaluate these three flags, you know, at the, at the teacher level or at the procurement level. So, and there's not a lot of, you know, nuance in interpreting these things. So picking things like, does the site have the, you know, does it say HTTPS? Or do the terms say we own your students' intellectual property? Or we do targeted advertising? Or we make the content public? I mean, those are relatively straightforward, objective criteria that you can have as pre-filtering. Um, the other thing is, for the stuff that's paid, procurement is really, you know, your best friend in, in this because the stuff, like, it's very hard to get something in that either requires something to be paid for or requires it to, to, to interoperate with your student information system. And those are kind of two triggers that could add extra checks in the process. I, I wish I had a good answer for this. I haven't sat in your shoes, and so I would hate to give ill advice, but... Um highly respect these two gentlemen, so listen I, to them. There's another layer behind what you're talking about too, which is like, what are we in service to, right? So risk management as well as resource deployment and management. Often people will deny technology or curricular requests because of a burden on a network or, you know, then tough, get a better network, advocate for a better network, hire more staff. I mean, that's, we're in service of educating children. So I would push back always on those sorts of things. I do, my bright lines are more like Tim's talking about. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times tech people will fall back on you know, defending their turf because they don't have the acumen to build a better system. Yeah, I mean, two, two other suggestions here. Um, first is, you know, don't, and again, it's a cliche, but don't let the perfect be the, en be the enemy of the good. Mm -hmm. And you need to, you know, start, start small, but start somewhere. Um, second piece of advice along that is just know that no system you put in place is going to make everybody perfect. Right. So starting light and building up and just being open about the fact that you are starting light and building up um, because you can have the most robust protective system in place ever which won't matter if nobody uses it. Mm -hmm. So you need to have a system in place that is both protective and usable. So again, I mean, it, it can it's easy to fall into the trap of thinking that you need to solve everything tomorrow. But the reality is, even if you could solve everything tomorrow, there would be five other problems that cropped up. So just identify your most pressing needs, address those in as light, with as light a touch as possible, and build from there. Okay, yeah, then, yeah. The consortium, um currently has 25 states that are part of the consortium with the idea of streamlining those data privacy agreements. Okay. Um, of those 25 states, 12 of them 
are using what we call the National Clause Set. They're kind of modeled after California. Okay. Uh, Maine is one of them. Okay, um, Andy was heading up the Maine Alliance, or started the Maine Alliance, and Drummond and Woodson, the attorney firm in Portland, drafted the Maine DPA, and they're part of a legal working group within the consortium okay. that continually keeps those updated and they're moving towards a national data privacy agreement. So, so it is all coordinated with the goal of, of streamlining the whole data privacy agreement process across the country. One of the, uh, one of the things that came up earlier um, in the session, I believe just prior to this, was appropriate levels of transparency as we're talking about um, putting systems and procedures in place. So again, question, general question for the panel. Um, how, how should we communicate this decision-making process and the existence of this process to the broader school community? Um, and how, how should that transparent communication include the criteria for what's approved and for what is not approved? Um, I dare on the side of as much transparency as, as you can do. Um, for instance, in the SDPC or other similar tools, if you hover over any of the agreements or the products or services, you can see the elements that are shared. Generally speaking, I don't think parents, and, and the reason why I like transparency is because I'm, my number one concern lately is parents pushing back on excessive screen time, and they also conflate that with an oversharing of their child's data with um, shit, you know, Facebook or whatever. They all sort of conflate the scandals they see in the news down to what we use in our schools. So they don't really care specifically about the individual elements, they just want to know that we're doing something. And if we keep that in a sort of a vault and we don't tell them exactly what we're sharing, then they'll, their minds wander to a place where we're giving out their kids, you know, favorite color and birthday and their phone number and they're going to be marketed to and things of that nature. Um, so to me, to sort of stave off the concerns that we see from uh, overly, um, you know, hovering parents, I go full transparency whenever I can. There was a really cool um, presenter in a April sitting in the front, would have to tell me who it was at CETA this year, and there were um, 20,000 parents that were surveyed talking specifically about screen time and some of their, their deepest concerns about um, you know, just children being on, on tech in, in a, the growing phenomenon. And they said that 40% uh, of parents were not con or were, were concerned about student data privacy and what data was going out about their students. The other 60, did they not know? Did they not care? Are they uninformed? It was definitely something that, you know, error on the side of um, transparency because you're, you're in a sense you're educating these parents. Uh, it's your responsibility to teach them what is acceptable um, and, and then lead by demonstration. So I love some of the things that some of the states are doing. Uh, New York, for example, you know, they have to post uh, on their districts, whoops, I keep talking into the microphone. Uh, they have to post on their district's website uh, all their approved apps. Now, my own personal opinion of that is, okay, well, what about the unapproved apps that are being used? But <laughs> as a caveat for another time, and unfortunately I don't have my own panel, so you can talk to me after, but the, the point is, is that, um, you know, I, I really like the fact that they have to have that transparency. It's mandated. Uh, it's back to that carrot and the stick. Sometimes you have to have rules and laws to get people to do the right thing, but that at least allows the parents who are concerned, we hope there are more than 40% of them, um, who can go on that district's website and be able to see not only the tools that are on there, but really be able to have access to um, what the district is approving as a whole. So more transparency. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't have much to add um, other than I think being posting the unapproved as well as the approved um, is good practice because it, I mean, it helps the whole school community know when apps are not approved. Um, and you know, I've often talked about over time how as we became more transparent, the number of questions that came to my attention dwindled down to almost none. Occasionally there, there still is something that comes up and it's usually because that particular parent hasn't you know, kept up the data, looked at the website or knew what we were doing. And once I explained the process and show them the website, then their, their fears have kind of gone away. So definitely the, the more transparent, the better. Yeah. 
Um, so I kind of start with, with FERPA as, as, as the floor, and if you look at what's required there, you, you, know, you have to say who you're sharing the data with, what's the, what's the purpose, um, and, and what specifically what, what data you're sharing. So I think that's what you have to do, but it also gives you a good opportunity to communicate to the parents for two other things that can counterbalance those fears, and that's why you're sharing it and how does sharing this data benefit their student and how you're protecting it, whether it's through um, an administrative control, like a, like a contract or data sharing agreement, or through a technical control, like the Google Admin Console or the Office 365 Console, <laughs> or other technical tools that you have to, to add security. Um, I think there are a lot of uh, good districts um, that have good examples of uh, very transparent uh, app catalogs. Um, uh, it's kind of part of the SDPC app. Um, Denver uh, has a, a wonderful uh, in-house in built uh, uh, academic technology menu. Um, Baltimore, Baltimore uh, County does theirs through a wiki. So there are a number of good models for how districts are sharing this information. Um, both the approved apps and the unapproved apps, I believe SDPC also lists unapproved apps. Uh, in Colorado, I think it's required um, that districts uh, publish the applications that they've stopped using or, or not approved. Yeah. I would even go a little bit deeper. I, I, I often look at the Denver site. I think it's a good model. What I'm trying to get my librarians to do, and, and a lot of these have this element, but almost like an annotated bibliography of why you're using the tool. And the next layer is actually showing examples of student work. Because like, if you're not in this little weird industry we're in, and someone said, oh, we're sharing your information with Kahoot and Schmoopy and Googly. <laughs> like, it's, these things are such stupid names. And you wonder, like, why on God's green earth would you no, give my kids not, information? I was not his Any mentor. of these sponsors? <laughs> Is schmoopy, or, you know, it's, I just made that one up, by the way. But it's called schmoopy. I'm buying yeah. that okay. right But now. The, the thing is, like, if you show me the value of what is, what is my kid getting out of this, then I'm more likely to support it. If it's just some catalog of bizarrely named companies, I'm wondering what, why. What's the value of this stuff? Be understanding so, what the purpose of that app is. Yeah. So I know it's a lot of work, and nobody's really quite doing this yet, but I think this is where I want to go once I can hire like eight more people, which is really aggregating examples of the student work to show why we do it. And that, that you know, I've had those conversations with parents who've come to me and said, I don't want my kid uh, participating in Google Apps for Education or G Suite. And I just have to like, go out to coffee with them and show them what we can do when we do share some data. And generally speaking, that convinces them, but I can only drink so much coffee. <laughs> um, so hey, uh, related question that came up um, as when we were talking about this, the question was about transparency and kind of sharing um, as much as possible with stakeholder communities. Just wanted to kind of flip that a little bit and curious if there are any details that you would recommend not being transparent about as part of a decision making process. Is there something that is best kept back or not publicly shared? I wouldn't share my red lines back and forth. I know sometimes when we put an agreement up and I've gone back and forth with the company, I don't like to show where I compromise because sometimes I think the compromises are just to justify a lawyer's fee. So they red line some stuff that's a, almost irrelevant. But I don't, I don't like to, I would not necessarily want people to know just how much I'm willing to compromise, even though I think it's, most of it's immaterial. I would hope, and I don't understand why, uh, maybe Jenna can tell us, why they don't all just sign the master's sort of agreements um, and agree with, you know, when we have a national standard, maybe that will change, and that's, I'm hopeful for that. Oh, I can certainly speak to that. Oh, no, we're videotaped. <laughs> We, we all are subject as companies to who pays our bills. Um, so whether those are investors or private equity holders, uh, shareholders, you name it. Um, unfortunately, there's, um, there are people who are on the more litigious side of life. Um, now back to what I said earlier though, you know, I really do believe that districts can drive this conversation. From the point I was a baby startup until we were acquired last year. Um, 
I was constantly bombarding Amelia and FPF about, you know, what could I do to do the right things about student data privacy? And as I met Steve Smith and I learned about SDPC, I mean, I was anxious to sign these agreements. It made my life so much easier. I didn't have to pay my lawyer 500 bucks or more an hour to read this agreement that I was inevitably going to sign anyway, because no matter what it said, I wanted the business. Mm -hmm. And so I was going to find a way to make it work. I was going to build the processes and I was just going to suck it up and do it. So, you know, I really love the work that Steve's doing. I know he's going to talk later and I don't want to steal his thunder here, but, um, you know, Putting districts in the driver's seat, like you really do control the conversation. Don't think you don't. Um, sometimes Google and Apple can be a little scary, but I mean, with with Schmoopy and other apps, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to let you have that down. <laughs> but Schmoopy, you know, Schmoopy's willing to negotiate. Okay, they they want your business. They want to work with you. I think what I would encourage you to do, though, as I have learned with some of these agreements, is it's not just signing it, though. It's really showing evidence that you can put the practices into place to destroy that data. Because that, there's a process behind that. It's not just click a button. There's a, there's a long process of how to build your company around some of these things that we promise in these agreements. So don't just take that signing of a policy or putting their name on some website as a, oh, they're doing the right things. It's definitely a, uh, it's a start, but there's a lot more that goes into it. All your thunder, didn't I? No, I have more. <laughs> <laughs> deferring? Yeah, I'm deferring. <laughs> so, this is a, so this is a tough one. Um, and originally I was going to say, no, I'll put everything out there. But in thinking this through, what you're looking for from parents is you're looking for kind of informed consent, which is not the same thing as comprehensive knowledge. Mm -hmm. And there can be too much information, especially when you think about the, the burden of maintenance. In, in a world where the web moves at web speed. So the minute I put some, the minute I write something about an application and vet it, it changes the next day. So I, I would be kind of very cognizant about putting something out there, you know, for applications that I know are constantly gonna change, and I would rather put out less information, focus on the most important piece, and not, and not worry about having to make check every week you know, what has Google changed today? Because once it's out there, you kind of own making sure that it's up to date. So kind of being aware of stale information. Um, I think you can actually over communicate in that this stuff is really complicated and it's very easy for it to get misunderstood. And I think, let's be honest, there, there, there is, this is an area where there are a number of very, very passionate and, and vocal uh, advocates um, that will look at something in the worst possible way. Um, so you need to kind of be aware of that. Um, uh, and just can you do this level of, informa of transparency information for everything that you have, um, including the things that you don't even know about? I think there are some really obvious ones. We know, all know kind of what the ones that they are. 90% of the questions that I get are about Google. Um, you want to be, you know, focus on things that have the most mind share and things from a data classification standpoint that have the most sensitive data. And so uh, there was a reason why I let Jim go first because <laughs> um, what seemed like a pretty easy question at first, the more I thought about it, it wasn't so easy. And um, I think Jim and I have a couple of the most um, uh, probing groups of parents for different reasons. One for national security reasons, and <laughs> other for, <laughs> for educational reasons. Um, so there is a balance between how much you put out there um, to, to, to be transparent and fill the need, but not put too much out there, because if you put too much out there, you're gonna get criticized and, and pushed back on too. So it's difficult to put, put your finger on it sometimes. Any, um any audience questions about things we've covered or things that we haven't covered? Yeah. So I'll go first. So it kind of gets back to how I answered the question earlier. It depends on the size size of your district and the configuration. I'm oh. lucky enough that um, in my office, we have the kind of decision makers all part of the core team. So even though there's instructional decision, there's a technical decision and a privacy decision, we all 
are in the same office space. So even though it's all done online, if we have to talk to each other, we're all right there. So I know other districts aren't gonna be set up that way. So it, ours, are, ours are in two separate offices, but um, we've evolved processes where there's, there's a, a, a weekly call that covers what the applications that are in the queue. Um, we've moved recently with experimenting to doing, to doing rounds um, where we do them in the, in the fall and the spring and, and the, the curriculum specialists go through and, and, and evaluate them first. Um, so I think there's a, a number of different ways to do it. We, kind of a large district, so we've kind of adapted to that process. Yeah, we're, we're a small district. Um, my CIA director, um, not like Jim's CIA director, um, is <laughs> across the hall and we just, we have a eavesdrop rule. We can listen to each other's conversations and say, don't do that. Um, but, but the truth is when you start to share ownership of these things and understand that they're not, that they're not separate things is when you can have success. So I think everyone's, you can lose a learning initiative because of a data breach, right? And you can tank other initiatives because of selection of poor software uh, on the technical side. So when we realize that they're interrelated and you have a good relationship with those departments, it's very helpful. But our formal process is not as strong as I would like it to be. In working with vendors, how do you ensure that what they're signing, they can actually do, uh, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to um, data, data deletion, data destruction, and the security measures that they could be committing to in signing an agreement. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, the, um, the largest school district in the country has a security plan, and it's extremely rigorous. And if you want to connect offline, I would be happy to talk to you about it. Um, it was something that blew me away. It was something that blew our lawyers away. <laughs> They're like, oh no. But it really, it, it made us change our conversations as a company. And I was so grateful for it because it took us a couple months to be able to get a pilot with them off the ground because we had to figure out exactly how we were going to do those things. So um, I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards and share that with you. There's also third party groups that purport to put you through an audit um, so I, I don't necessarily, I know they're expensive and, and many free companies would never pay for that level of audit. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not meant to be comprehensive. However, there are some out there that you could, if you looked at, you should feel comfortable. They probably have had to go through a certain level of uh, audit. Mm -hmm. I know maybe Steve will touch on this in the, in the next section, but I know in several of the states in the, in the SDPC agreement, there is a separate um, a, a addendum that basically s the vendor certifies data destruction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, his was one of the agreements we had to look at after that and say, okay, wow, you know, it, it's time. It's time we come up with the processes to, to be able to really be able to say with fidelity that we can do this. Yeah. Also, just a quick note on third party and, um, and third party audits. Just they can be good, be highly skeptical. Um, when you are looking at a third party auditor, it's often useful to um, take the, third, the name of the third party and um, do a search for that name with DuckDuckGo alongside settlement, fraud, or dispute, <laughs> and see what turns up. Um, also, do a... Um, <laughs> do a uh, do a do the same search on um, if you can track the branding or the name of the organization do that same search on past iterations of the same company if they've been acquired do the same search on iterations of the people who acquired them often some of the less reputable third parties will rebrand um, after having a settlement so basically just take the uh, take the name of um, of the company and add settlement add fraud, add FTC, add complaint. Um, it's just a series of search strings that can turn up interesting information about an organization. Okay, I have a, uh, I have a final question for y'all. Um, what is something that we didn't cover in this, uh, in this time that should be a subject for a panel at the next one? <laughs> I'm always interested in um, the, role, the extent to which a school can act in loco parentis in a way to get around, not get around, in a way to sort of <laughs> relieve the obligation of COPPA, which has been abdicated by many vendors and pushed onto us. 
So I'm always looking for, I've heard many different uh, takes on that. I mean, I, I can act on behalf of a kid in many other capacities, but to, has anybody really pushed that concept? So I'd love to hear more about that, if anybody has. You mean anyone other than the vendors? <laughs> right, correct. Yeah, they've clearly done that part for us, but yeah. I need some more time. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so two things that come to mind are best practices around both um, other types of data sharing agreements, like between agencies, schools, and mm -hmm. other agencies, and uh, research agreements or requests for research and best practices on managing that process. So. Yeah, I would agree there's a lot of confusion around research because most people look at it as, well, it's just for research. It's an arbitrary good, so the ends justify the means. Um, I think specifically if you want to extend the, the conversation around vetting, um, there are a number of, of, of large systems that we, that we deal with it in, in education that are constantly changing, Office 365, uh, and, and Google would, would be two. Um, in our district, we've been using uh, G Suite for since 2009, and, we, and we've evolved a pretty mature uh, governance process. So our kind of our vetting has extended into ongoing, ongoing governance um, because there are 20 to 30 changes in that set of tools every month. Um, so we meet monthly and look at what what has changed, what, uh, what configuration changes we have to decide on, what, um, what opportunities we have to turn things on, and then what support do we have to add if we do that, what level of communication do we have to add, both internally and to parents, whether or not there's additional permissions that we need to, to add, um, because while the, the G Suite um, education agreement covers the core G Suite stuff, that doesn't apply to the 44 other things that are not part of the core. Um, so that kind of, how do you move from individual application vetting to uh, governance of kind of these large complex systems? The question is how do uh, best practice or process for handling um, browser extensions? Uh, you know, basically I would just expanded to both Chrome extensions and Firefox extensions that uh, basically add functionality in the browser. Yeah. I Start with them off and then wait for the need to arise. It's interesting, like that's where you actually see a lot of that rebranding of product, like an abandoned product or some shadowy company that started that product. Um, those are very slippery. And that's just the, Jim mentioned the you know, 44 elements of G Suite that are, you would, most people would think are G Suite, right? And so there's a whole other world out there. I would treat them as individual pieces of software and put them through the similar process. They're harder to track and they're harder to reach out to those people. Um, but you still have to do it. Some of them don't even have websites where you can yeah. even contact them. Or privacy policies <laughs> yeah. um, would, would be, would be the other part. Contacting them. <laughs> right. But, um, we, we try, it, it's, it's, a, it's a piece of education technology that accesses education record data and in many cases it's asking for permission to read and write your drive and other things. Um, this touches, since you mentioned Google, um, and, and part of that ecosystem, this kind of touches on something that's related to app vetting and where's the threshold of what gets vetted. You know, most people aren't going to vet a content website, but what if it's the Washington Post and you have a login? So what is it that triggers the vetting process? A lot of folks say, well, if the student logs into it. Well, in my world, it's if it's housing student data, the, you don't get a free pass if the teacher uploads it. Um, but with, with Google, one of the things that is often kind of willfully misunderstood is, well, I'm logging in with Google. I'm not creating an account, right? No. Um, in fact, in some cases, it's, it's the most um, invasive um, because you're giving that application the ability to act as you. Um, you know, it's like uh, full power of attorney. Um, so I think that's some of the things that come in. Um, there are some things, if you're not in a Chromebook world, there are some things um, recently that you can do. Uh, Google Enterprise Managed Browser gives you a lot more control over tracking what extensions are being used um, in your G Suite environment and the ability to, to block them. Yeah, one, one in I mean, my personal recommendation is to actually treat every extension like a standalone application um, because actually extensions are also often a vector for malware attacks because 
an extension could be started by one by one developer and then acquired by and there's actually a, a marketplace for acquiring orphan extensions that have over a certain number of installs mm -hmm. and then you push an update to the extension that contains malware yeah. mm -hmm. um, that's actually a common attack vector for a range of things so actually an ongoing review for browser extensions is also again problematic I mean difficult to do but recommended yeah, a Andrew's practice is something I've heard from a lot of our districts when we do data reviews with them. They're like, extension, out, done. And we've absolutely seen this situation where the initial intent of the company, it's acquired and then repurposed in a, in a negative or malicious way. And it's just that the app store, I mean the um, Chrome extension store is a whole other animal <laughs> than is say the app store, which is a little more closely curated Okay, I'd like to thank the panelists for a wonderful discussion. Thank you.